Hi, I'm Rick Heaton, and you're listening to the Scene World Podcast. It's the Scene World Podcast. I'm AJ. Jurg is somewhere. Yeah, hi. Hear that music? It's different from our normal opening music, and for a reason. Uh, this music was actually composed by Warnock, who is one of the real the real heroes of the NTSC scene. And you probably heard it before somewhere. I think maybe the second or third demo I ever saw had this music in it. Warnock was a member of some of the the real huge NTSC groups like Arson and RPG and Style. He's a coder, a graphics guy, and has compu- and has composed some of the most recognizable music in the entire scene, NTSC or otherwise. He's also influenced a ton of North American sceners, me included, because Warnock is the guy who taught me how to code back in the mid-90s when I was just a mediocre graphician trying to break into real demo scene stuff. Warnock, Tom Wilson is his actual name, has been having some problems lately. He has severe arthritis, which has necessitated a double hip replacement, um, and he and he's still on the mend and is having some trouble covering living expenses, and 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 so on. Uh, he's been battling a lot of this pretty quietly over the past year, and only just recently a, a has a GoFundMe been set up to help with, uh, I mean, a, a pretty modest goal of of about three thousand dollars. Um, over the past month, a little over 1,500 of the 3,000 uh, goal has been raised. So if, if you guys, our listeners, want to help out a real demo scene legend, uh, this would be a really good way to do it. Uh, the URL to the GoFundMe is www.gofundme.com slash tbv963w4. And, uh, of course, we'll link to that in the podcast description. Uh, I'm certain that any contributions would be hugely appreciated and, I mean, Again, you know, aside from being a demo scene legend, he's a really good guy in general. And anyway, start. All right. So, so we're carrying on. What? Uh, in, a, in a minute, we're going to be talking with Susan Bennett and Karen Jacobson. They are the original voices of Siri in the U.S. and in Australia. And yep. in the meantime, what's happening in Newsland, Yurgatron? Yes, well, so here we go. The first thing, Uncle Art. That means yes, Dave Lowe Dave will Lowe. have his movie. And they started a Kickstarter. His daughter, Lucy Lowe, started Uncle Art Dash the film. Hmm. So if you wanna if you wanna pledge for that, which I really would reco- re- recommend. Um, because we spoke to um, Dave Lowe two times, uh, once as a video interview via Skype, and once in our podcast with his daughter um, Holly, Holly. Jaslow. And actually, um, the, the other the other daughter who was doing the movie was in the podcast briefly. She came into the room and said hello. That's true. That's true. Yeah. So, and all the news is that Uncle Art will have his own booth at the retro area at Gamescom nice. in August. Nice. Yes. So, shake hands with with the man who who transported most arcade arcade machine music to consoles and home computers in the eighties and nineties. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's really pretty awesome. That is pretty cool. Oh, yes. Though that would be kickstarter.com slash project slash 16221052279 slash uncle <laughs> slash uncle dash art. No, sorry. Jeez. Oh, actually, right. We'll slash put a link uncle... to this in the description, the right. podcast description. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Let, let me talk it out, please. Because if you if you're using the complicated URLs, I'm I'm allowed to do that too. Yes. So if you want to pledge for that, the URL is kickstarter.com slash projects slash sixteen twenty two fifteen oh seven 
29 slash uncle dash art dash the dash film. Okay. Yeah. And we will link to that in the description as yes. HA said. Yeah. Yes, indeed. I love services. With <laughs> easy to remember URLs. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so what else we got going on? Yes, and then there's this this new project from two of the guys who actually did, um, as they said, some global best-selling stuff, whatever, for the DTV. So they did, I don't know, something like marketing or whatever for, for the DTV. Okay. So they know their stuff. And they're actually working on a new C64, and they call the project The64. Yeah. It's yeah, it's actually two separate. It's Commodore 64. One is a console, and the other one is supposed to be a real handheld version. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Well, I don't know. I don't know if that is going to be promising. I, you know, I don't like the fact that um, I, I, I checked it out. I actually looked at it because I saw it mentioned some places, and they don't. Yeah. They don't go into specifics ah, on what wait, platform it's going to be. Wait, wait, wait. I was going to say that. So because I think the same, I actually talked today to one of the project's um, members, Darren Mailburn, and she said the CTO will post soon the technical specifics okay. of the two computers. Um, so anyway, the project URL would be indiegogo.com slash project slash the dash c64 dash computer dash and dash handheld dash console yeah that's easier to remember because there's no number in between yeah yeah it, you know it, it strikes me as kind of like and it feels very emulated to me like it's just not, yeah but it's going to it, be one of those things that's you yeah know, but if it's similar to the DTV, which actually was not not bad hardware, and you could right. connect your preferences to yes, it, and yes. and uh, and um, and a drive, and a keyboard, and whatsoever, and the second joystick, then I'm okay with that. Okay, it's not it's not as as I see it, it's not like a totally reborn 64 like the C64 Reloaded, which I actually own. Um, but that is hard to get because they are very limited. And um, if this is a new version that is good enough in compatibility as the DTV and has filters in the SID chip yes. in contrast to, to, to the DTV because the DTV SID didn't have filters, which meant, which meant it didn't sound right in many occasions, then I'm fine with that. It's a lot better than... What Commodore USA did back in the day, where they just yeah. used an ATX case and yeah. said that's a Commodore 64. So, well, I mean that that had nothing to do at all. I mean, it looked yeah. like a Commodore 64, but the, yeah. the internals, the 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 the, the, the technology had nothing at all. I mean, it really yes. ran Windows. Yes. So, I so mean, that that's... means the internals will decide whether it's going to be a success or not. Right. If they are the distribution guys from the DTV, then they know what they have to do to make it a success. Potentially, yes. yes here they write a project is headed up by the video game industry veteran, veteran Darren Melbourne, which I spoke to today, who conceptualized and brought to market the DTV console. So he actually did the concept of the C64 DTV. So you could say he co-invented the concept of the DTV. So... I hope it will be something similar because then I'm fine with it. Yep. So speaking about Commodore products that are yep. arriving. Yes. Oh, uh, well, so that was two of them. And then there's also that thing called um, Friend Up, which actually is kind of um, an Amigo S like operating system, but What's it working called? from the cloud. What's it called? It's f called Friend Up. Friend up, yeah, friend up. And, I've never um, heard of that before. You just said yeah. Well, it's kind of new. They first announced it, um, at least from my knowledge that I heard about it first was the 30 years anniversary of Amiga in um, Noise last November. I mm -hmm. think it was where I have been there.
And um, so they announced recently that two of the former Commodore UK employees, David Plassens and Colin Proudfoot, actually joined the project. And they opened a beta version, version 2 recently. So I, I had a look at it. It's pretty neat because this is it's the, working. The Friend it's working Universal the platform. Yeah. Or unifying at, platform, rather. I'm yes, it's, it's at Friend os.com and yes. first first reaction was what has this to do with commodore or something and then i figured okay it's a cloud cloud based computer like an amiga because the operating system is similar mm -hmm. it's it's actually pretty neat um i actually didn't have a look at the beta 2 i just had a look at the beta 1 but what i saw was pretty interesting so it's interesting news because the two famous UK Commodore guys are on board now. So it's definitely worth checking out. Um, so yes, though this clears the myth why they are approaching Amiga events so much because mm -hmm. the platform is is um, similar to what Amiga OS was like, but in the cloud. Uh, right. Yeah. So it's it's supposed to help also if you have programs from different operating systems and you can use them all in, in the same platform so okay. yeah yeah it's it's a, it's a new approach and dave david Plassens, he he's he thinks it's a ne next big thing in the operating system world okay yeah so this is something to keep an eye on um as we talk about future projects here in our podcast too i thought we should mention it yes so that actually are the main news that I figured. Well, well um, also, uh, I, I, you said something to me recently about there being another Commodore phone. Yes, yes. Massimo announced on, on his Commodore channels they are working on the next generation of their Commodore phone, smartphone. And that will be interesting. So... So we said, you know, we, we, we actually had a copy, or yeah, we had a copy. We had a a demo Especially unit. Especially made for us. <laughs> yeah, we had a, a demo unit of the Commodore phone sent yeah. to us, and we reviewed it. And so where did he announce this? Because I'm looking at the Commodore page, and I'm looking at the Commodore Twitter, and I'm not seeing. Maybe it was in Google Plus or something. Um, I don't remember. Google Plus. Because I'd be I'd be really interested to know what the next generation of the device is because because when they spoke there to was us, no spe there was no specifics actually right well I you know I would imagine if they're still working on it there wouldn't be but you know we one of the big negative parts of the pet smartphone is that it is a is that it is based upon a Chinese phone that. And and they didn't, you know, this wasn't something that was a secret or anything. They they basically came right out and told us this, which is starting a new company and, and having a new device and all is very very difficult to do because getting the 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 R and D and and the 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 money behind creating a device is is difficult for a startup company. So they used something that was already available that they could that they could work with and then depending on how well that did they were going to then take the experience and create something that was unique and specific to them right so they had this, the commodore smartphone which was that derivative device and my position the whole time is that okay the, the commodore smartphone was or the pet was okay but what I want to know is what the next device is going to be. Because if they, if the next device is, as they say, a unique original device, that is what I would be really interested in rather than a rebranded Chinese phone. Mm. So well, if they're announcing that they're working on the next generation, then I would like to, you know, have an idea of, of is it something that they're co-developing with someone? Is it something that they're developing for themselves? Like how is this? How is it working? And 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 where are we? Where where are they going with it? Is what I want to know. So I should ask Paolo Besser. I'm pretty sure he knows. Yes. Um, yeah. So anyway, what is good about Commodore, at least recently, is that they started taking more focus on the support and Did they? helping people. Yeah. 
actually on the Italian Commodore Pet group on Facebook, they got some feedback that that a customer from Italy got a call from a rep representative um, from Commodore in Italy, and um, they worked out some details of um, return the broken phone and stuff. So, okay, yeah. Cool. So actually, we actually, actually had kind of following our um, following our review. Jörg did an unboxing. I did a review, um, and following that, some of our some of our readers and some of the people that have watched and listened to this stuff actually sort of contacted us with issues that they had as far as as far as returning uh, uh, phones and getting tech support from the company. And when we sent and – and I guess it's okay to, to mention this now because yeah. by now they will have received it. Um, when, yeah, and, and you should we also put back, the letter on, on the – on the page, yes, yeah. we will put a copy of the letter on the page. I when when I sent the letter back or sent the uh, the phone back to them, um, I sent along a letter saying that I I don't think it's our job to act as a as a mediator or a middleman in in resolving disputes, but but I mentioned that some people had expressed issues with with getting tech support taken care of on this, and that we would be happy to forward any information you know, back and forth that would be needed to kind of facilitate it because we want, you know, we don't want where we are. We're in a kind of a unique position in between sort of everybody. So, you know, <laughs> yeah. so, so if, if we can pass on the information that can help the, the, our, our readers and, and listeners and whatnot, as well as, you know, help Commodore do their, do their tech support and, and get stuff done better, then I'm all for that. And, yeah, so actually we got a feedback we got a feedback on the video review that you did mm -hmm. in the comment section on YouTube that that the letter helped and oh, that really? we, that we put we put their their nose on the problem. So <laughs> yeah, so that's that's a nice thing to hear that people appreciate um you you going forward and Telling that to them, and I think I think we were the only project actually that got a demo unit. I, I haven't seen any other review out there that wasn't from a person who bought it. Uh, yeah, and uh, you know most of the reviews that I've seen were from people that didn't even have one that were just kind of repeating the same the same yeah, stuff. Yeah, but over those and over. those who did reviews and had them bought them actually. Right. Right. Yeah. Nobody actually got a. Um, a demo unit, and I think we were the first one, and the only one who did an English review, actually. Hmm. Okay. So, if if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. yeah. So you know, this new phone hopefully will be interesting and and good. Yes. Yeah, so at at the moment, a lot of things is happening around the Commodore stuff. Might it be new sixty sixty four hardware? new movies about the topic or whatever there's Those actually a lot of, of stuff going on recently with with yeah. the the commodore there is a a project that i just learned about a week or two ago uh the sid fx it's a stereo sid thing it lets yeah. you put in two different kinds of sids and it'll... without 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 soldering yeah or yeah. or or messing up your c64 yep, yep. it just and... kind of sits in there and you clip it in yeah. and and yeah. and it can automatically um automatically detect the right one to play it with and exactly it's it's really kind of an interesting thing it's what's it's, the URL of that do you know uh sidfx dot something um sidfx dot kick slash uh, sidfx dot kick dash ass dot dk I did pre order too but they didn't want my money yet yeah yeah no they they don't. They don't ask for that. They just they just want your information, put you on a mailing list. Yeah. And I mean it's 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 actually it looks like a really cool item that, you know, it, it can either it can either let you combine two different SIDs. It can you know, you can switch between the two. It can work as a stereo SID. Um you can uh, it it helps actually protect the the chip because it it um uh, I, I, you know, I don't, I don't remember what what it does, but it does some somehow it 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 helps protect it because it uh it it figures out voltage or something. 
Yeah, it's, it's also interesting that it's supposed to be compatible with any C64 out there, even yes. the C64 Reloaded. Right, right. Um, and, well, they suppose to release it around November where the new X party is in Holland. So let's hope that's going to happen. So I actually pre-ordered. Cool. Another so thing I. that another thing that happened right now is a new paper magazine coming out from Ireland. Really? Called Eight Bit Eight Bit Magazine, yeah. And the URL would be Kickstarter.com slash Bojack slash eight bit magazine. Okay. Slash eight dash bit dash magazine. Mm -hmm. So um that's interesting. And it's actually by John Kavernack, who is a former editor in the field of retro computing. Okay. So he has the experience. And he asked for um, 800 euros, and he got already 1,654 euros. So he's overfunded. Oh, okay. And there are still 23 days to go. So this will be pretty much a success. Yeah. Hmm. And, yeah, and a uh, spoiler alarm here, I will be interviewed in the first oh, issue. Okay. Ah. Ah. My, my first English interview in a magazine, because so far only Germans interviewed me in magazines. <laughs> so, I've, as Gary would say, I will pop my sherry in the first English interview in, yeah. that, hmm. in a magazine, yeah. Why doesn't anyone ever interview me? I don't know. I'm pretty awesome, I think. Nobody interviewed us because of our podcast. If somebody would, you would be in the first spot. Actually, it's interesting that most of the focus from the press was only German press. I mean, yeah. So I'm looking forward to be more globally mentioned. That should be our goal. Yeah. So anyway... That's actually all the news I can gather. Well, in our, no, I wanna... not, not really. There's one more thing. Walter Day announced that there is a movie right now hmm. being broadcasted. Um, actually, on April 16th, so tomorrow. And that is on the 25th annual florida film festival okay and it's a new movie about retro gaming it's called man vs snake the long and twisted <laughs> tale of nippler okay yes. okay yes so that's also a nice nice thing so you see it's interesting because walter day concentrates on country music since 2010 but he is still active in the arcade scene as much as possible you can't get him away from video games. <laughs> well, hey, you know, we can bring up also as far as, you know, the arcade scene and video games and stuff, a video game con 2016. Tickets are on sale if you go to um, videogamecon.com. Did you uh, get yours yet? I did. Wow. I will be there. It's it's running Saturday and Sunday on um, sept uh, uh, September 10th and 11th. Uh, I will be there on the Sunday. Oh, but yeah, so it. But the tickets are on sale. Um, you can go and it's. Uh, you can save five dollars if you buy now. We'll we'll put a link in the podcast description on how to get there. Uh, I mean, you can go. You can look up a video game con twenty sixteen on Facebook, and you know the, the website is you know a video game con dot com. So yeah, so it's and and it's really good prices for the tickets, and if it's anything like last year. And I'm I'm sure that it's going to be bigger than last year because this will be the second year it's do it's going. Um, it'll be really fun and interesting. So everybody should go to that. That is in the what's area. the ticket price? Ticket price is the base price for uh, Saturday tickets is twenty two fifty. Uh, Sunday tickets is seventeen fifty. Uh, Sunday, if you want to get the early bird, it's also twenty two fifty. Um, again, these these ticket prices will be going up. Right now, it's it's seventeen fifty for the Sunday tickets. In June it'll be twenty. In August it'll be twenty two. At the door you're talking twenty five. So, mm. so you know it's probably best to get it done to get them, but get them now. I mean you for you can get you know the, uh, a t shirt uh, Saturday and Sunday uh, early admission, and that's only like fifty bucks that they're asking. So, 
Nice. It's nice. actually, yeah. I mean, it's it's really decent prices for tickets, and it's again, it's the same kind of thing as as, as last year, but probably bigger. You know, there's there's console free plays, there's you know cosplay contests, there's arcades, there's panels, there's auctions, and 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 a video game themed burlesque show apparently again. So it's the same Lily Lily Wonder Stitches. Hake. Lily, Lily Stitches, Stitches will be there. Lily Stitches will be there. Wow. Nice. Uh, well, uh, I, you know, I assume she's going to be performing. I don't know that for certain. She's going to be at it. I don't know if she's going to be. Mm. They haven't really come out and said what's going to be happening there yet. But um, you can listen to our podcast with her. Yes. And Bonka, we're in our last podcast, December podcast of the last year. So if you want to, if you want to see that video podcast as well, go to our YouTube channel, watch it youtube.seamworld.org uh, don't miss it out it has fancy christmas background too yes it does we were very festive <laughs> yeah all right well i think we've babbled enough on our intro yeah. we've got we've got susan bennett and karen jacobson waiting right over here so let's pop on over to them and talk to siri voices yes yes we are talking with susan bennett and karen jacobson who this is sort of a little um, in- Inception esque in that we have two of the original voices of Siri, and voices of lots of other things as well, in the in the same room together. So we're hoping the universe doesn't completely implode. Talk fast, <laughs> <laughs> just in case. Yeah. So welcome to the program, though. Thank you. Thank you. And that's actually the first time you two talk to each other, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Sure is. Great. So you, Karen, you are originally the Australian ver- voice of Siri. And uh, sh- yes. And you, Susan, are the American voice. Correct. M- maybe let's start with uh, Susan. How did it actually happen that you, well, spoke in the words for Siri? Well, uh In 2005, I started doing a recording through a company that I work with a lot that does telephony. And we were reading a new type of script. But my impression was that we were still doing more phone messaging. And uh, these scripts were written in such a way that they didn't necessarily make sense because all of the sentences and phrases were created for sound more than content. They were trying to get all of the sound combinations in the language. And so it was kind of interesting, challenging, extremely tedious. Uh, but when Siri finally appeared six years later, uh, it, was a, it was a huge surprise. We had, we had no idea that we were going to end up being a persona. And the thing that complicates the whole thing is when you do phone messaging, typically as a voice talent, you're not really threatened because those voices are pretty anonymous and quite unnoticeable. When people are listening to phone messaging, they're not listening for the voice. They're listening for the information that the voice is giving out. So they typically don't pay attention. Suddenly when your phone voice becomes a persona like Siri and people are interacting with her and she becomes a kind of a digital person, uh, that, is, that, that does uh, have an impact on your, on your career. So it's been, an, it's been an interesting ride, shall we say. And how did you start it, Karen? Well, mine goes back a little bit further to 2002, and I was asked by my agent to audition for a client who was looking for a native Australian female voiceover artist living in the northeast of the United States. And um, I read that description, and I thought it was a description of me, and I went along to the audition, and... I recorded some phrases and some words and I got the job on the spot and they told me that we, I would be recording a text-to-speech voice system, that we would be recording for about 50 hours and I booked the job. So they took me up to upstate New York to a town called Ithaca and put me in a hotel for three weeks. And I recorded a maximum of four hours every day to uh, create this voice system. They did not want my voice to sound tired or fatigued in any way. And 
At the end of my three weeks, I went back to my life in New York City as a singer and songwriter. And it wasn't until over two years later when I got a phone call from a girlfriend out of the blue uh, saying that she and her husband were driving from Maine back to New York and she said, uh, you know, we I bought my husband one of those new G- GPS thing- thingos for Christmas and we're driving and I said, why don't we put it on the Australian voice? So we switched it over to the Australian voice and she said, oh, and, and Karen, she said, it's you. You're the you're giving us directions. And I turned to my husband. I said, oh, my God, I gave you Karen Jacobson for Christmas. <laughs> and that, that's how I found out that my voice was in uh, an, one of now quite a number of brands of GPS units around the world. And fast forward another seven years uh, when Siri popped up. And I found out my voice was also in hundreds of millions of Apple products. <laughs> ah, I see. And this is also by you are nicknamed the GPS girl, right? That's right. Now, now you've got you're you're the voice of GPSs for um, for actually competing brands. You're in Garmin and um, TomTom and all this other stuff. Did they all get that from kind of one voice pool, or did you do each one? Was that sort of something that they each approached you separately or, or? So I worked for a third party company to create a text to speech voice system. And that was the original system that many companies have licensed or ha- uh, got permission to use. I have subsequently recorded many, many individual customized voice systems. So it's really a combination. And neither of you were as as Karen just said she wasn't aware that she was on these things until someone someone told her about that and that was the same with with you right Susan you didn't know that you were the voice of this until someone pointed it out to you yes before Siri arrived I actually heard my voice used in a couple of different um, scenarios and I think one was a GPS but uh, the Siri thing was another thing entirely a but uh, a voiceover friend emailed me on October 4th, 2011, when Siri first appeared and said, hey, we're playing around with this new iPhone app. Isn't this you? And I went, what? And I went on the Apple site and listened. And yes, there I was. Now, do do either of you actually use the products that you're that you're in? Because I know when I when I listen back to this, when I edit these these podcasts, I cannot stand to hear myself because you don't sound like what you think you sound like in in real life. So I can only imagine if I've got a GPS or, or my phone is is me talking back, I would probably just break it and run away screaming. <laughs> well, I I have found that, and I'm, I, I suspect many voiceover artists have the experience that over time you become very used to hearing your own voice recorded. Initially, it's a very strange thing, but over time it becomes another sound your very set of sounds you're very used to because it's part of our everyday interaction with ourselves in terms of business you know we're recording scripts consistently and hearing ourselves back and getting an idea of what sounds good and what works for a client so i'm very familiar with that now and in terms of using the products i didn't use a excuse me i did not use a gps For quite a long time, I live in New York City, right in Manhattan. I don't own a car, so there was no need for a GPS. But after uh, uh, quite a bit of attention came my way from my voice being in GPSs, I uh, was interviewed actually when I was in out in Australia quite a number of years later. And during the interview, they used a GPS with my voice in it, and it was very interesting and entertaining to have that experience. And not long after that, I was spending a period of time in Australia. I had a GPS that I was using, and I did put it on my voice. And I really saw it as, uh, as I guess, um, I'm trying to think how you say it, but some kind of market research 
to to understand what people were talking about and what people were experiencing and uh, quite a number of very funny experiences ensued with my family with my husband and my my infant son at the time and he was he knew it was my voice in the in the GPS and I wondered if he thought everybody's mummy's voice was were in different electronic <laughs> devices, but so so we we really did have a lot of fun with that. I had uh, I've been doing voiceover for for decades, and so I'm used to hearing my voice on radio and TV commercials and documentaries and and all sorts of things. But I will have to say it was a totally different experience to uh, to hear it, you know, coming out of a phone and uh, interacting with other people. In fact, I found it quite creepy, <laughs> and I did not use Siri. And I didn't use her when she had my voice, and I don't use her now that she does not have my voice. So <laughs> 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 it's not that I have anything against Siri. I just, um, I don't know. It, it's really crazy. I don't listen to audiobooks or I don't listen to, to talk radio either. So I don't know. I guess uh, I do enough talking in a day to, to, to last me. <laughs> yeah. It, but it's interesting. I've, I've seen on YouTube a video actually where you, you, where you said, um, things in different ways and you can actually imitate the way Siri speaks. I mean, this little bit robotic, right? And you have a problem with that? <laughs> exactly, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What can I help you with? <laughs> exactly. Oh, right? that's so good, Susan. That's so good. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, they did a lot of manipulation to the voice because my husband, who's an audio engineer, and I were, were uh, messing around with it a couple of years ago, and, and I was interviewing myself as Siri. And we were trying to get most of the answers from the phone uh, to make a recording, a demo recording. And some we couldn't get her to say some of the things that we wanted her to say, so I said them. But he really had to do a lot of audio manipulation to get it sound exactly to get it to sound exactly right. So, you know, they, they played around with the voice to, to make it sound the way they ended up having it sound. So yeah. we don't really know any of the details or what actually went on because Apple has never recognized us, never not acknowledged us. And um, I have, I knew someone who wanted to do a documentary about this whole thing and no one's talking. I mean, everyone pretty much has non-disclosure agreements And the only reason that Karen and I are able to talk to you right now is that we do not. So as I said before, we worked actually for the text-to-speech company, not for Apple per se. Apple actually came in after the process. And for me personally, I don't even know who chose my voice. I don't know if it was the, the three engineers who created App, uh, Siri to begin with or if Apple chose the voice afterwards. I, I really don't know. And I don't know that we ever will. <laughs> <clears throat> so you didn't you didn't go through an audition like Karen did? No, my experience was completely different from Karen's. That's, that's really interesting. Yeah, completely different. Hmm. I like your experience, Susan. You were just hired, and that's that's the way to go. Yeah, I mean, I was auditioning, I guess, but I didn't really know it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's wonderful. Painful audition. We like this. We like this. <laughs> hmm. There must be a I benefit of... I meant to say painless audition. <laughs> that must be one of the benefits of, of having your voice in so many places. You know, what we were talking a little bit before we started recording about uh, how you're, you were on the first, uh, the first successful ATM machine. You sang a jingle for it. And, well, the uh, problem with it is in, in, in many ways, and I will have to say I'm extremely grateful for the whole thing. I, I love what I do, and I'm just very grateful that I'm able to make a living doing what I love. So that's a big plus right there. Um, having said that, I will have to say that human beings tend to like to stereotype. And so it would, took me a really long time to decide to reveal myself as the original voice of Siri because I wasn't sure how it was going to impact my career. Because I don't just sound like Siri. I can sound like a lot of different people. And I'm sure Karen can too. And But the thing is that people stereotype you and in our ADD culture that we have right now, no one's going to bother to look into you to say, oh, she does a great Siri. Gee, I wonder if she could do a cartoon. No, they're not going to do that. And because of technology, the onus is on the, the talent nowadays. We really have to get out there and put ourselves out there. Whereas previously, uh, the agent did that for us. You know, or people would go to an agency and say, hey, what, who could you recommend that would really help us with this? It's, not, it's no longer that, like that. It's, it's a giant crapshoot now where everyone, is, everyone and his brother is auditioning for a part. You know? And so it's... it's, it's It's gotten, uh, you know, technology has definitely affected the business uh, dramatically. It's, it's really been kind of a revolution compared to what it was maybe 15 years ago. 
Yeah, it's interesting because if you if you notice that that, that at the beginning um, things were more artificial. Actually, many people don't know that Siri is is spoken by human voices. That's right. That's right. Everyone thinks it's uh, computer generated, um, but. You know, they had to get the original sound. They, you know, uh, computers can speed up a voice, slow down a voice. They can put reverb on the voice. They can compress the voice, all sorts of things to change it audiologically. But the actual sound itself, at least so far, has to come from a human. <laughs> well, plus, it also has... Uh... With this AI stuff, I mean, who knows what's going to happen in the future. But, you know, yeah. up to this point, and especially 10 years ago or even more, as Karen said, uh, when the recordings were done, uh, it was certainly up to humans at that point. One one additional piece about people not knowing or not knowing if a voice belongs to a human being, I, I, I won't tell you which one, but one of the major GPS companies, their actual CEO did not know that the voices were real people. Oh, jeez. Oh, so, okay. so it's pretty common. <laughs> See, it's it's one of those interesting things, also in that you know, with 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 Siri especially, but also GPSs, they've got there's an, there's a certain inflection to the voice that you can't that computers don't do too well, you know, because there's there's text to speech on on you know on most Macs and and on most PCs, and they can kind of make this a humanish sounding voice, but it doesn't quite get that that sort of. You know, GPSs and, and, and Siri, they they always sound like they're smiling at you even when they're being snarky. You, you know, it's got that kind of, like, I, I can't even describe it. It's just a, a human quality to the voice that you can't really get from something that's just generated. Mm-hmm. Yeah, not so far. I, you know, if you listen to the Siri voice now and compare it to the Siri voice on the 4S, uh, you'll hear that it's been smoothed out a great deal. But I think that sadly, a lot of people just don't realize what an incredible feat this whole thing is. Mm-hmm. They just take it for granted that you could, you have a question and you go, boop, you hit the a button on a phone. And this person says, what can I help you with? You ask your question and immediately she has an answer. And people get very frustrated. They want, Sammy doesn't understand my voice. And, I, you know, and it's like, well, think what you're asking of a tiny bit of technology. You're asking this thing to recognize... <laughs> <laughs> Every accent and regionalism in, in the country, really? You think about what that means, you know? So, yeah, it's, it's, it's an amazing feat of technology. It really, really is. So, Yes, so, so I wonder, Karen, how is it for you, actually? Did it change your career? Because Susan, Susan that, that um, things changed in her way, in her life that nowadays it's no longer just agents. Nowadays you have to go out and say, hey, I'm the original voice of Siri. How was it for you, Karen? Uh, it's changed my life in a lot of ways. I, you know, I, I am a singer and songwriter first who happened to fall into voiceover work a couple of decades ago. That's funny. Yeah. The same is true for me. Oh, I love it. <laughs> Although I'm not a songwriter, just a singer and right. keyboard player, but... Uh, sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. <laughs> That's okay. I, I also play piano. And I, you know, I have, uh, I've been extremely grateful to voiceover because it has, gosh, it's just always been there and always been there as a uh, a great income stream alongside of my creative pursuits. I love the art of voiceover. I love the being given a script and making it come to life. And I love playing the accuracy game. I don't know if that's part part of what you enjoy, Susan, but just to really be able to sight read a script a hundred percent the first time to be able. It's to... more difficult these days, don't you think? Yes, uh, I do. Don't, people don't really know how to write for things to be read aloud. Since it should be short and succinct, and they should be punctuated. <laughs> no one knows how to punctuate anymore. Oh, so. I am. I agree. Yeah, I it makes I, it makes our job a lot harder. It really does. <laughs> and I, I mean, I think back to what I consider the heyday of, you know, certainly for me, it was the in the the later eighties and all through the nineties, and it mm-hmm. was a very exciting time in that industry, with really great writers and 
great content and scripts and uh, the volume of work. And I, right. I love that so much. Yes, yeah. Uh, and, but in terms of how it's changed my, um, my career path, I have, you know, I started to get a lot of attention for my voice being in GPS units, first of all, before becoming uh, known as the Australian voice, of, the original Australian voice of Siri. And I, I was, I knew there was something in it because people were so excited and so delighted and they were talking to me like they already knew me, like I was a part of their family, like I was a part of their lives. And I started to inquire, I suppose, what that would, where, where this could lead, what I could do with it. And I became clear there was a brand for me to create. And I am... Um, I'm somebody who has had a lifelong love of personal and professional development and I made the connection between directions in the car and directions in life and I created a, an empowerment brand called the GPS Girl. So I'm now uh, somebody who works regularly as a professional speaker, a motivational speaker and I travel around the world and I speak about how to recalculate your life and how to recalculate your business and I've written two books and recorded nine CDs on my own independent label. And I, you know, I absolutely love to help people navigate change and mm. and work with people in that capacity. And I find it is a very nice match of my skills. And I really enjoy the meet and greets that I do. And people still come up to me and talk to me as if they know me and as if I've taken all these wonderful trips with their family and they want to tell me the name they call their GPS. <laughs> and it, it's, um, it's completely unexpected to have had these developments and I, in my business and I'm, I'm super like Susan, I am super grateful. I just love that I get to connect with people in such a very deep way mm -hmm. uh, out of something as simple as a, um, a voiceover job. But I guess it must have been um, creepy at the beginning that people telling you they screamed at you and you are part of their family and stuff. <laughs> um, I, I don't know if I found it creepy. I, I found... I find a, a lot of aspects of artificial intelligence really creepy, mm -hmm. uh, like Susan. Um, and, you know, I've done interviews and been involved in conversations where I've learned my voice and voices like ours are being used in lifelike robots, uh, life-size life-like ro robots. And that, to me, is very strange. And when I saw the film Her, I... Oh, yeah, I saw that one. I mean, that, that movie really went into a creepy zone. However, I don't think we're very far away from what that movie talks about. Yes, but in mm -hmm. terms of, yeah. but, but in terms of my own personal experience, I 99% of the time people are just lovely about it and are so genuinely sharing from their heart about an occasion where we've been on a trip or got lost or they come and they want to apologize to me for yelling at me <laughs> or they, you know, I've had letters from, you know, nine year old children who've written songs in my honor. I mean, it's pretty beautiful to have that kind of thing. There isn't anything creepy about any of those things, but, uh, but the direction is out of it. Artificial intelligence is headed. That is that, that gives me pause. Yeah. There's this video circulating in the last weeks, this human like robot who can actually stand up when he falls down and stuff. That oh, that thing is creepy. cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's cool and creepy but, at but the same time. You know, time. you take yeah, that exactly. You take that, you take that little robot that can that can fall down and has great balance and can stumble through the woods and stuff without falling. But then and then and then you take something like this thing that Microsoft just did with this Twitter account that they put on and it was supposed to learn from other people's tweets and you know become this like ai that could tweet back and it took about 10 hours before it became horribly racist and was just posting the most oh, no. the most awful things and they ended up pulling it down because and and you think like when you merge these two things together it's going to happen <laughs> you yeah. know it's yeah it's true at one point it's um fascinating on the other point it's also 
well, making people a bit afraid of the future. Yeah. I mean, I like technology, but I am fearing it could get out of hands maybe in the future. I don't know, out of control. <laughs> major thing that we're not really addressing with, you know, robots and AI is, you know, there are seven plus billion people on the planet. What are they going to do for jobs when all the robots are doing them? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And you've got a generation of kids that, that don't know how to calculate math without the phone. They don't know how to answer any kind of, they don't know how to research or look up anything without the phone. And it's kind of like, okay, it looks like maybe <laughs> the humans, hmm, yeah. the humans may be coming obsolete. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> it makes me wonder if the humans are going to have to go find a little plot of land and grow their own vegetables, and I'm not exaggerating. Oh, I think we're almost there. <laughs> yeah. Every day you read something on, uh, you know, on the, red, uh, you know, on the, uh, on the web or in the news that, oh, you shouldn't eat this, you shouldn't eat that, and all, you know, all these, these things, that are, these chemicals that are around. And so, I don't know, it's a, it's a challenge. Um, but I think it's very important to be positive and, and try to do positive things towards other people. And, and Karen is right about the fact that I've also had a very, very um, positive experience with being the original voice of Siri as far as people... Uh, contacting me and uh, I too have started doing some speaking engagements as a result of it which is is kind of fun it's certainly gotten me out of my recording booth where I've been in prison for about a decade awesome <laughs> yeah so um, yeah it's it's been a very positive thing in many many ways and it's certainly been a very large life lesson so those are all good things so um, is there anything of you two that you would like to do in voice acting, voice recording that you didn't do yet? Yes, I have lots of things. I have not had, uh, Susan probably ha has had this happen many, many times, but I, I would love to have a major role in a cartoon. And I think the big dream would be a Pixar film, to have a, you know, a, a voice role in a Pixar film would be I'm right there with you that that oh. would be that would be my dream job too um I thought you would have done that already. Network, but um but not very much and uh and you know there's such a group of incredibly versatile and talented uh people that are doing animation in Los Angeles and I understand it's a very difficult group to break into but um that I would absolutely love doing that. So, so Karen, maybe we should start up our own production. What do you think? I love it. I'm, I'm in. I'm in. Let's do it. Siri and Siri. Well, Siri and Siri. I love it. <laughs> yeah, just just like I said um, before the recording to Susan, um, Karen, actually a year ago we spoke to the voice of Mario and Luigi, Charles Martinet. Oh. How fabulous. Yeah. <laughs> and a lot of people don't realize, too, that voiceover artists, it, it is really a form of, of, of acting. It's voice acting, just like, yes, that's, just like yes, anything exactly. else is. Exactly. Well, I have been thinking for a long time, Susan, about having some kind of dinner. And I don't know which location in the world, but we could find a, find a city. And, uh, and you and I, and I'm sure we could find a good half dozen other pretty iconic speaking voices to to go to that dinner and and have a pretty fabulous time well i'm coming to new york on wednesday so oh! if you want to have a coffee let me know oh i do <laughs> let's do it <laughs> i'm right in midtown we'll make a plan <laughs> yeah I guess you already have each other email addresses because i emailed you both at the same time a couple yeah. of times so I You're guess responsible you can. for bringing us together. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. So yeah, I mean, that was totally surprising. I was just um, emailing you both, and you were um, replying to me almost at the same time. I guess you, Karen, were five minutes after Susan, and then I was like, okay, well, we got a deal. So that was pretty pretty straightforward. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, so, so you said, actually, you are both also singers. So... Susan, you also started first at, as, a, as a singer? Yes. Yes, I, actually, I started playing the piano when I was four. Uh, I, I play by ear, 
And so the next door neighbor happened to hear me playing this toy piano and ended up give, giving me his upright piano. So I took lessons. And in, starting in high school and college, I started to sing. And in college, I started singing in a band and working professionally. And I've been doing that ever since. So what style do you actually sing? sing? Well, when I had a, a, a band that played for private events. And so we really had to cover just about every style. Um, but typically, my voice is pretty... Uh, I don't have a big belty voice, which I kind of wish I kind of wish I did because I love rock and roll. But um, we, we do a lot. Of, I, I do a lot of you know. I was in a jazz band at first, and then um, uh, you know a cover band that played a lot of different material. And now I'm in a band that uh, is called Boomers Gone Wild, and we play nothing but '60s and '70s rock and soul music. So that's really fun. Great, so. great. But that's just a hobby, not not something you do as a business. No, uh, well, it used to be a business. Oh. Now it's it's uh, now it's even more special because it's totally just for fun. Okay. I mean, we do get paid, not very much, but we get, we do get some money. <laughs> uh, but it's just an absolutely wonderful experience. We just have a fabulous time every time we do it, and that's how I got into voiceover. I used to sing a lot of jingles. Now, I'm really dating myself here, but in the uh, '70s and '80s, they would um, record a lot of uh, singing jingles for. Uh, radio and TV commercials, and this was a this was a career actually. You know, we did it several times a week. And one day, the voice talent didn't show up to read the donut of the spot or the you know the actual copy, the sales the sales pitch. And the owner of the studio said, "Susan, you don't have an accent. Come over here and read this copy." And so I went, "Oh, ding ding ding! I could do this." And so I found a voice coach and then a, then a uh, talent agent, and I've been doing voiceover ever since. So it was kind of a hap happily accidental. Yeah. I see. I see. Yep. And how was it for you, Karen, to start with your singing and stuff? Uh, similarly, I, in the late 80s, started to do uh, jingle work. I had moved from my hometown of Mackay to Brisbane in Australia and I was observing what professional singers did and I noticed that there were singers who were hired to sing sessions to record jingles and I went up to the most the busiest jingle singer in town and I said what do I need to do to be a jingle singer and she said well um, you need a demo a demo reel Uh, and I thought, well, how am I going to go about doing that? And uh, long story short, I found a way to do uh, – well, actually, no, I didn't find a way to do a demo reel. I started to call studios around town, and I said to them, I would love to be a jingle singer. And they said, oh, well, can you send us your, your reel? And I told them I didn't have a reel, that I'd be happy to come in and sing live in the studio – And I made 22 of those phone calls and had 22 no's. I was 18 years old at the time. Oh. <laughs> Now I, I cannot believe that I kept going um, and kept saying, <laughs> kept, kept calling. And on the 23rd phone call, I called the most uh, successful studio in town, uh, which was called Sweet 16. And the most successful producer in town answered the phone And I said, gave him my spiel that I uh, wanted to sing jingles. He asked me, to, did I have a reel? I said, no, but I'd be happy to come in and sing live for him in the studio. And he said, okay. And I went in and I sang live for him in the studio. And he had me sing some harmonies and, and sing along to uh, some big campaigns that were on air at the time. And then he said, that's great. We'll be calling you. And I thought that would be that. But uh, the following week, he did call me and booked me. And from that week on, I was booked as a jingle singer. I was still at music college. And I was in the studio three to five times a week singing jingles. And it was a very, very exciting time to overnight have an income from the music business. And after several years of doing jingles one day I said to somebody in a studio you know if you ever need somebody to to do a voiceover uh, to do something I, I'd be happy to to give it a go and this particular studio owner said well let's let's be serious about this if you're interested in doing this why don't we record you a reel and get you an agent and it was one of those stars and moon and the sun all lined right. up yes they all and lined up 
Oh my gosh, Susan, it was crazy. And and before I knew it, I was in the studio recording my demo with the best agent in town coming in, watching the, the, the demo be recorded. And they took me on. I was 21 at this point and I had moved to Sydney and I was with the best agent in Australia and the 1990s were very good to me. I had 10 very strong years of, uh, of voice work in Australia before I moved to New York City. Did you actually move to New York City because of the job? Uh, no, I moved to New York City pursuing music. I'd always wanted to live in New York I, I, ah. and live in America. I was seven years old and I was watching TV and on came Olivia Newton-John and I was just struck by her and wanted to be just like her, this blonde Australian singer who'd moved to America and everybody loved her over here. And I'd always wanted to move to America. So at the age of 31, I finally did that, sold everything and came over here. And you've done some, some uh, off-Broadway stuff too. Yes. A one-woman show. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> That's right. I play piano and sing and I write songs. So mm. I perform reasonably regularly at off-Broadway off theaters and, and venues around New York City. And I've um, performed in a lot of different places around the world. And very happily, I get to combine uh, the message of recalculating and my voice work and music. Right. <clears throat> Well, we have we have two keyboardists and singers. I, ah. I, I can play drums. Let's start a band. Perfect. <laughs> a series. <laughs> Great. So, so where can actually people find out more about you? Well, you can check out my website, which is susancbennett.com. And you can contact me on Twitter at SeriouslySusan, S-I-R-I-O-U-S-L-Y. And on um, Instagram is Susan Bennett VO, I believe. And uh, Facebook, I just at this point in time, I just use for people that I actually know. So I, I need to open up. I need to make another uh, a Siri page there, but that's not happening right now. We got to get you a business page, Siri. Um, yeah, Susan. you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you started to say Siri. <laughs> yeah. I did. I did. Thank you. I would you appreciate because that. Because you said seriously, Susan, before. That's what happened. <laughs> that's what happened. Um, I can be found almost everywhere at the GPS girl. So I can be found on Facebook, the GPS girl, Instagram, the GPS girl, Twitter, the GPS girl. And I have a YouTube uh, channel with quite a lot of different music clips and LinkedIn, of course, uh, at the GPS girl. And I love to connect with people and hear their, hear their fun stories <laughs> and, uh, and the names that they call their GPS unit, <laughs> or the or the time I the ones I, that can be printed. <laughs> exactly, exactly the ones that can be uh, can be uh, printed in company. Well, sure, I, I will I will make sure to make to make myself connected to you oh, and to keep yes, in touch. Will. Wonderful. That's, that's really interesting. And we will um, put links to all these these sites in the podcast description, so people can click exactly. on them and check them out easily. Wonderful. Thank you. Exactly. And now we just have to work out our time for coffee, Susan. Absolutely. Yeah, I'll, I'll send you an email. Perfect. Great. Um, <laughs> thank you, guys. I appreciate yeah. it very much. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, thanks for taking the time to talk to us. It was a pleasure thank you having so you on. Thank you so much. All right. Great. Okay. Bye -bye. Bye. Keep in touch. Bye bye. Bye. And again, that was Susan Bennett and Karen Jacobson. Uh, you can find Susan online at uh, SusanCBennett.com. You can find her on Twitter at Seriously Susan, and that's seriously with an I. Uh, she's on Instagram at Susan Bennett VO. Um, Karen Jacobson, you can find her at TheGPSGirl.com. She's also on Facebook as The GPS Girl. You can find her on Twitter as The GPS Girl and Instagram as The GPS Girl. Uh, YouTube.com uh, slash Curly Queen is the username. And we'll put links to all these in the description, like usual. Um, well, that's it for the podcast. Uh, for Jurg, I'm AJ. We'll see you next time.